Today's guest is Ed Mills, who is a millionaire school teacher. Let's hear his story and how he was able to accomplish this on a teacher's salary. Welcome to Richer Soul, Life Beyond Money, The Last Baby Step. Imagine it's 12 months from now. You've achieved your major life goals. How does it feel to be in the best shape of your life, to wake up energized, excited about the day? What's it like to have great relationships, friends who support you and propel you forward? How does it feel to have an excess of money, to be able to make the choices you want, to be fearless and open to trying new adventures? Imagine being connected to the universe and it providing everything you desire. It's possible over time. Your past does not dictate your future. The only thing holding you back from this vision is you. It's time to take control of our thoughts and use them to our advantage. I help people live the life of their dreams and bring balance to health, wealth, relationships, time, and spirituality. You can learn how by listening to the framework in episodes one through nine. It's simpler than you can imagine. You can also hear actual coaching calls by looking under the coaching call tab on richersoul.com. You'll also find all the show notes for this episode there, and there's a link in this episode. I send out a monthly email, and you can sign up while you're there. In the monthly email, I share the best articles I read this month let you know about upcoming episodes, and share a little wisdom. I also share the most interesting articles I read on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash richer soul. Today, I want to focus on mindset, and I'm going to read out of a page out of the book, Get Weird, Make the Most of Your Life, by one of our previous guests, Jake Eagle. We repress whatever we anticipate will be intolerable. Different people find different things to be intolerable. Some people repress specific emotions, such as anger, but are comfortable expressing joy, while other people, it's the exact opposite. Some people repress certain kinds of thoughts, such as memories. There are people who find intimacy intolerable, and that's what they repress. We repress what we anticipate will be intolerable as a way to minimize our anxiety. When we repress, regardless of what we repress, we squelch our life force. We use our personal energy to deny or avoid certain things or feelings. Whether we do this in our interactions with other people or in the privacy of our own minds, it's not usually the best use of our energy certainly not over a long period of time. Repression tends to cause confusion and quash our intelligence. I find it astonishing how really smart people fool themselves when they repress. And when we do this in so many ways, some are small ways that happen numerous times throughout the day. Other forms of repression show up as major life patterns. Let's say you're mad at one person, but you take it out on someone else, a safe target. In this case, you're hiding the target of your feelings from yourself. Or maybe you hide the reason behind your feelings. You make up a false reason. This is called rationalization. Or you hide the source of your feelings. We do this when we project onto someone else how we're feeling or what we're thinking. Most of us do these things without realizing we're even doing them. Each act of hiding seems so small in and of itself. We act as if this doesn't matter. But do you remember the equation of doubling a penny every day for 28 days and you end up with over a million dollars? This is sort of like that. Each time we step away from ourselves, there is a cost and the cost adds up. The ultimate cost is that we lose ourselves, we lose our health, 
and we lose the possibility of having truly intimate relationships. I thought that was quite interesting, and I wanted to share it with you. It's funny how the same principles always apply. Just as wealth builds over time from the compound interest curve that was shared in that example, it happens to other parts of our lives. Our habits compound and our behaviors compound. And they may be very teeny small things. And yet, small things do compound over time into big, massive differences. And that's why we need to be mindful of what those are and to be self-aware. As I've said before, the reflection of the mirror is our biggest enemy. And that's what we've got to overcome. I'm working on these myself. And while it sounds so easy to fix, it's actually quite hard. Today, we're going to meet our guest and we're going to talk about small habits and how small habits turn into big habits and how small things can dramatically turn our life around. So let's meet our guest, Ed Mills, who blogs at The Millionaire Educator, a website dedicated to teaching educators how to build wealth on a teacher's salary via frugal living, hardcore savings, and prudent investing. From 2002 to 2016, both he and his wife worked as public school teachers in Georgia. During that time, they enjoyed a seemingly normal middle-class lifestyle and had an incredible son and grew their net worth from $100,000 to $1 million. The Mills family has spent the 2017-18 school year in Meridia, Mexico, where they studied Spanish, worked out daily, and simply enjoyed life. That sounds like a lot of fun. Let's meet Ed. Welcome to Richer Soul, Ed. It's great to have you join us today. Thanks for inviting me, Rocky. I appreciate it. Oh, it's a wonderful honor to have you here and to share your wisdom with our audience. So we like to start at the beginning. What was it like when you were growing up, and how much did your family and school teach you about money? Let's start with school. I just spoke with my wife about this morning, and I don't even remember learning how to balance a checkbook in school. I honestly do not remember having any money subject or topic come up through K through 12. So I would have to say goose egg on that. And the message I got from family, like a lot of people, the notion of hard work was pushed but that was it. So that's good advice, but it's only partial advice. But in some ways, I regard that as bad advice, because if you keep working hard, you think it's just going to resolve itself. Let me just say that I never learned anything about the importance of saving or investing, never really saw good credit card management and the use of loans and things of that nature. My parents, they were self-employed, had their own business, and there was a lot of cash flow. Cash flow is not wealth, correct? So we appeared somewhat wealthy, but there always seemed to be a lot of money stress in the sense that pressure to make bill payments and things of that nature. I knew something was wrong and I didn't quite understand until I was older and had my own money to manage to see what was going on. So other than work hard, get your grades and go to college, that's all I really heard, money realm. And it, that's really not even money related, is it? But I think for our generation, that's what we were taught. And that was the message. Work hard, go to college, buy a house with a white picket fence, two kids and a dog, and that's the American dream, and you'll be happy. Yeah, well, and, and I'm glad I got the work hard message because I, some people, unfortunately, don't even get that. But, you know, going forward, like with my own son, I realize there's more to teach him than to just work hard. That's a basic assumption. You better work hard or you're going to be left in the dust. So what are you doing? What are you teaching him and what are you sharing with him? Well, in addition to work hard, we make sure he does a good job in school and he's been an excellent student because he does work hard and he's got natural aptitude. But in addition to the work hard message, we really push the importance of saving and investing your money. And what I've done with that is set up a savings account for him and up my account at Vanguard for him. It's invested in the life strategies growth portfolio, but every year I show him when his dividends hit his, when they pay out, and I have them pay directly to his bank account. So when he sees $70, for example, I think that's what he got last year in June, 
that's a lot of money to a kid. At, uh, he's 12 now, but 70 bucks is a lot of money. So I'm trying to show him that the money he saves and invests can pay him money. I guess because I never heard that message as a kid, and I think it's very important that he know that. Another thing I've really started talking to him about is basically avoiding debt and how dangerous that can be. And it just seems that everyone is loaded up over their head in debt these days, whether it be so-called good debt, whether a mortgage or a, a student loans. And uh, I'm kind of prepping him mentally for doing a, a runaround on that so he doesn't have to take on that debt. And I've saved money also for college and 529s and the Coverdale Ed Savings account, things of that nature. So I've been stressing that. But I guess at the end of the day, I'm trying to set him up where he has a solid financial education. He's 18. He gets his degree, has no debt. And maybe he's got forty, fifty, hundred thousand dollars $100,000 saved to his name already. And when he gets a job, he knows what to do with his money. You know, prepping him for his future... And ideally, he's going to leapfrog all the disastrous missteps that I made. And I'm sure he's not going to work a plan perfectly, you know, because he's going to be 18 to 21. But I just know what type of headway you can make early. And I'd love to see him do that. And I will set him up for that as best I can. And that's all you can do is lead by example and offer them the path. And then they've got to step up and do their own hard work. Exactly. And I do see that he does appear to have a very good head on his shoulders. Now he's 12. Like I said, he hasn't gone through the teen years yet. That might all go up in smoke. We'll see. (laughs) I'm sure it will go well. So you mentioned making mistakes. What are some of the mistakes you made along the way? And was there a turning point that kind of changed things for you? Well, let's see. Uh, I guess my mistakes were not saving. So I just kind of muddled through my 20s. You know, I played basketball overseas for a while. And then I eventually became a teacher around age 27. And I wasn't making much money. But I never saved anything. So consequently, I never had anything. And I would live paycheck to paycheck, school year to school year. At some point, I realized my answer would be a graduate degree. (laughs) <laughs> and I went off to school in Texas and got an MBA. And then I also was doing another degree in, in uh, Hattiesburg, Mississippi, a teaching degree, a master's. So I was doing two degrees simultaneously in a sense and got those. And at age 33, I went off to Saudi Arabia to teach English. This is kind of where I started to write the ship and I Got my net worth up to zero because I guess my student loans put my wife and I in the hole $45,000. So after two and a half years, I got us up to zero. And then I started saving money. I had never been in a position where I actually had surplus money. I think that was at like age 35. You see your bank account had 3000 and 6000 And I think I was saving about 3000 a month at that time. And then it became fifteen and I didn't know what to do with it. So I had read some of John Bogle's writings, and I knew I wanted to use an index fund. And then I started investing in some Vanguard index funds. And by the time I left Saudi Arabia, I was 38, and I think I had $100,000 in net worth with no debt. So I thought I was king of the world compared to where I had been. I would say the turning point was in Saudi, reading some of the John Bogle books. Another book I always cite, the Paul Terhorse book, Cashing in the American Dream, How to Retire at 35. He kind of gave me a vision to save my money and invest my money for some financial freedom and financial independence. But then I wasn't quite sure what to do. 9-11 happened. We made our way back to the States. We ended up taking a teaching job in LaGrange, Georgia. Basically, we took that job because it's halfway from my wife's hometown of Tifton and halfway from my hometown of Ringgold, Georgia in North Georgia. So we ended up staying there seven years. And during that time, we continued saving our retirement accounts, a 403B and IRAs. And in seven years, I think we got our net worth up to maybe $450,000. And, you know, it sounds crazy to say we had pretty good net worth. I was 45 with like close to half a million, my wife and I. And, but we just didn't feel like we were doing as much as we could 
And then in 2009, I don't know if you have like a mad scientist part in your brain, but I just started formulating a plan where if we were to take another job and use all the retirement accounts that we had access to and fund them all fully, how we would be able to like hit the fast forward button on our net worth building. And so in 2009, we quit our jobs, left our home, and we moved to a rural South Georgia school district. And we just went to hyperdrive on the savings mode. And in three years there, we saved like $250,000. So that's essentially been our story is that we've been filling all our pre-tax buckets to the max since 2009. And it's been very effective for us. And that, I think back to Saudi, that was a big trigger in my head to save money. And then in LaGrange, Georgia, that last year, I realized I want to know what would happen if we were able to fully fund every account available to us, 403B, 457, IRA, and eventually we added health savings account. And that was a really good plan for us. It worked. It wasn't very, didn't require a lot of active investing or anything too intricate. It was just good old hardcore savings, as I call it. And how do you save $250,000 in three years on two teacher salaries? Okay, this is the part that drives some people crazy. At my previous job, I had a 457 account, my wife and I did. And so when you separate service, you're able to use those funds. So I think we had $90,000 between us. And I tapped those for living expenses because they are not subject to pre-59 and a half withdrawal penalties. So that meant I was able to go in from day one and just fully load up all the other accounts, knowing I had money, I had a financial tailwind at my back that I could pull and live from, pull that money strategically to live from. And that's pretty much what I've done is since then, I always use that money in 457 accounts to pull from for living expenses. And we've also since 2013, use the 72T provision in the IRA tax code to, uh, we get about $18,000 a year from that. So, you know, we live frugally, we live within our tax paying threshold. We can pull money from those and have enough money. And then when we take a job, we save all our money. And by using these types of accounts, you pay very little in taxes, correct? Correct, because we try to keep our withdrawals to the end of the 10% tax bracket. And now with the new tax code, there's actually a quite a big 12% tax bracket. So, you know, I, I don't mind going into the next tax bracket, but if I can live in the, at the end of the 10%, I'm happy. You know, when you figure in the child tax credit, a lot of that, the tax obligation goes away for people at that tax range. So, yeah, we pay very little tax. I think my tax goal this year is about $1,000 is what I'm shooting to pay, federal income tax. Well, that's your goal for this year. But this year, you're not earning money, correct? Oh, uh, that's correct. But I am. I did pull out a little more this year because we bought a house in December. And so I'm going to do some prepayments on, on that. So, I mean, I might actually go into $50,000 of income. But, that you know, like I said, all... All those withdrawals are made knowing where I'm going to fall in the tax bracket, which I know a lot of people, they just take income and they never know what their taxes are going to be. So just having a general tax plan has been very beneficial for us. And you're being intentional. You're actually looking at what the outcomes are going to be yeah. from the choices you make, and you make sure that you make wise choices that keep your tax bill to next to nothing, which is a smart move. Yeah, when I first started doing that, I never really read anything about, you know, intentionality and being intentional, but I guess I was doing that. And, you know, you don't have to have a perfect plan. You don't have to work it perfectly. You just got to be kind of going in the right direction. I think Ramit Sethi in his book, one thing I still remember from that, he said, he's not really into the budgeting and all that. He shoots for big wins. And that's what I do. And you let me keep my tax bill in check load up my retirement accounts to the max. Those are big wins. I can live with that. And so as two teachers, you become millionaires. Right yep. now, you're not even working. You're hanging out, enjoying life. Where are you currently? 
We're in our last week of Merida, Mexico. We came here last August for the school year, and our son spent the sixth grade here in a little private school, bilingual school. And my wife and I just kind of enjoyed life. It is year two of not working. And I have to admit, I can become pretty lazy. I had very ambitious plans for blogging and all this. And I did a little, but I wasn't too prolific. So I have some shortcomings in that area. But it's nice to get up and work out every day and go for a jog and, you know, sleep into you feel rested. And it's been a great year. And it, it hasn't cost a lot of money. I think, think we're averaging about 1800 bucks a month as the expenses or cost us to live here. So it's been a great year. I've learned a lot and it's been great R&R. Do you feel safe? People are always worried about safety in Mexico. We read the current news and it seems like there's all sorts of problems. Yeah. When I read the stories in the paper about Mexico, I get nervous, you know, and I live here. I always tell people the hardest part about living in Mexico is explaining to your parents and your relatives that it's as safe, if not safer than where I lived before. Mary is very well known for its safety, and the people here take great pride in the fact that it is safe. There is quite a police presence here because, you know, there are problems in various parts of Mexico, particularly in the border region, and there's been a lot of problems in Cancun this past year. And apparently a lot of that, say, in in Cancun, Quintana Roo, and south, has been a lot of drug cartel, cartel cartel-on-cartel violence. Apparently things are shaking out over there. I was in Cancun a month ago for a school trip, which I have to say was the greatest school trip ever at an all-inclusive resort for three days. It was just like always. I felt very safe. In March, I spent a few days in Cancun, in town, we used to stay, and we actually spent two months there before. The vibe felt the same. Now, all the locals tell me, be very careful in Cancun. But, you know, the thing I know about Mexico is that when you're here as a family, just kind of living a normal life, I'm not out at the cantinas at one in the morning, drunk off my butt. Maybe in a previous life, that would have been more commonplace. But I just haven't had any negative vibes here. I'm sure you could find trouble in a heartbeat if you really wanted it, but I'm not looking for it. But here in Merida, where I am, it's very sleepy in my neighborhood. You could almost say at times it's boring. I'm sure it's beautiful, though. Oh, yeah. It's hot, though. That's the big complaint. Like, that's the only expat complaint I hear. Like, today it was 98, and I had to walk about eight blocks to the school to pick up my son, and I was like, wow, it's really toasty here. But other than that, yeah, it's a great place, and the people are awesome. They're very friendly, and I think from the historical perspective of where they are in Mexico, they always had a lot of foreigners coming in and out of here. You know, they have relations with Cuba, Belize, New Orleans. So to be an expat here is not like a big deal. People are very hospitable, incredibly hospitable. And your cost of living is a fraction of what it is in the United States. True. And at the same time, we have the shopping, for example, that we have Costco, Sam's, Walmart. We have really awesome Mexican shopping like Shade Rally, Soriana. The malls here, you, you go to the mall, you go to the food court and eat, and you go to a movie. Very reasonably priced and top notch. The public space in Mexico, from at least I've seen here, you know, you don't have to worry about like getting mugged in the parking lot and people acting a fool in the movie theater. That just doesn't happen. It's very admirable. I really like the dynamic here. It feels great. And that's interesting. I've been all over the world to different places, and I've been to Mexico. I think mostly it was Cancun just because it was a vacation type of thing. Right. But when you read the news, it just fills you with fear. And the reality is that's not the case. I mean, I saw the same thing going to Italy. Everyone makes you freak out about Italy. Oh, you have to worry in Rome. You're going to get mugged and this and that. Yeah. All the fears, none of it happened. I think there were no worries. And I think, unfortunately, we let the media and all these stories prevent us from going out and exploring the world and finding awesome things. Yeah. You know, I played basketball in El Salvador, and and I have friends from El Salvador, so I visited it, spent a whole year there one time, and I never had any problems, but I know stuff happens. But if you were going to, I mean, that's definitely not a place you just wander around, but people are like, man, you're in El Salvador? I'm like, yeah, but it, it wasn't like, I'll give you an example. I remember one time there was something on CNN, and it showed like machine gun fire at a market. And apparently the guy was pinned down, and it was like a live feed from the market in San Salvador. That was so far from where I lived, and that was like a freaky thing. But, of course, it was like live streamed in America. My parents like, are you okay? 
Oh, I, I've never been to that market one. I'm glad I wasn't there, but the fear will build, you know, and I've spent three months in Brazil by myself. I was in Rio one time back in 89, and it was pretty tough economy back then. You know, I would see abandoned street kids and things of that nature. But, you know, if you're keeping a low profile, and I, I don't walk around with a watch or a gold jewelry or anything, but I saw foreigners doing it. You just, like, set yourself up to be a mark. So if you're just cautious and not out too late and not stumbling around drunk, I, I think you avoid so many of the problems. That doesn't mean, like, you know, like a nightmare scenario can't transpire, but the probability that's very low and it's a risk I would consider taking. Now I have to admit, now that I'm here with my family, I'm a little more risk averse, but yeah, the world, there's a lot to see and do. And if you just are afraid to go see stuff, you're missing out. Absolutely. Now you mentioned you got your MBA along this journey as well, correct? Yes. When I was trying to figure out what to do. That was 1994 to 96. I went out to Laredo, Texas. It's one of the few schools that would accept me. I had kind of, uh, I went to Davidson College undergrad and I was not a very focused student. I was a basketball player there. And, and so consequently, you know, getting into a top notch school at the time was not going to happen. And I did my MBA prerequisites and did fine in that. And I ended up at Texas A&M International as it's known now. Did an international business MBA. And, you know, I learned a lot, just got some general business education. But I always tell people at that point, I never had any money and I wasn't working a big time job. So I didn't really know much about money still because I never really had any go through my hands. And it wasn't until I went to Saudi Arabia and started teaching. And that's when I started reading like, you know, personal finance books and things that were applicable to my real life that I really got the real education. But that said, I'm glad I went and did my MBA at a minimum. It gave me the background to understand the personal finance information, and it also ended up paying me more as a teacher because in Georgia, you get basically $6,000 a year for a graduate degree at the master's level. So it paid dividends. I never really worked in business using that job or that degree, but it still was a good investment for me, and I didn't pay a lot for it, really. And it doesn't sound like they taught you much about money. No, I have to, you know... International marketing, international management, international finance, uh, very theoretical, you know, and I'm not putting down the school. I'm sure it's very similar to most curricula. Yes. But you're taught to be a worker. You're not taught to be a financially independent millionaire at age 30, which knowing what I know now, I view that as something very doable. It's most people could do that, but you got to have more of the personal finance slash financial independence knowledge, not the corporate business, you know, training, which is basically what an MBA is. That's correct. They don't teach you how to become wealthy. They teach you how to make other people wealthy, which is fine. I remember being in that program. I had a lot of classmates who were working real jobs. I was teaching ESL at the university in the morning and doing my coursework at night. And I would just hear them talk about their jobs and the hours and and then I'd hear their pay, and it was a little more than teachers were making, but it didn't seem like it was worth it. The trade-off, all the hours and weekends, and I thought to myself, God, I'm almost done with my MBA, but I don't want to do those jobs. That sounds like a nightmare. And that's when I went, I got the job in Saudi Arabia through a Booz Allen consulting firm out of D.C. And I stayed in education ever since, you know. So and I think for my temperament, I chose wisely. You know, you can't argue with success. You're a millionaire. You're semi-retired at a young age. You're able yeah. to be with your son and do the things you want to do. Who's to argue with that? A lot of teachers, unfortunately, they don't understand the opportunity they have. And I'm not saying public school education is all rosy. And I know it varies by state. And I've seen a lot of teacher strikes, like, for example, in Oklahoma and West Virginia. But in my state, Georgia, which is, we don't have a unionized workforce. It's a right to work state and the pay is pretty good. I think this next year I have a specialist degree, which is kind of like between a PhD and a, it's above a master's. And I'm at the top of the pay scale. I think my base will be 67,000. But you know, the cost of living is moderate, especially in rural Georgia where I'll be living. And there are a lot of opportunities to save there because in addition to a pension, which I'm vested in, and my wife is also, you, you have 
the 457 and 403B. You can still do an IRA, an HSA. And some districts, like the one I will be working in, they actually have, I think it's called a 401A. It's like a pension fund in lieu of Social Security. So there's going to be six pension buckets that I'll be filling next year. And I guess what I'm getting at here is teaching might not necessarily be the best job for lifestyle, but it can be a tremendous job for hardcore savings. If you want to really put some money away, the buckets are there. And this would apply to a teacher who might be in this situation. Say you don't have a big debt load. And let's say you actually have a little bit of money from inheritance or somehow you worked and saved money. Well, you can go into a teaching job and load up the accounts. And, you know, I think it was 2015, my wife and I saved over $100,000 in our various accounts. The last year we worked, 2016, I don't have my numbers before me here, but uh, I believe we saved over $80,000 in 2016. And that was just a partial year you know, January through August, because we had resigned from the jobs. So we worked two jobs in Coffee County, and I believe what the numbers were in those two years, we saved 243 or $246,000. So basically, we just view jobs as opportunities to save money. And by flipping that whole thing on its head, it's been awesome, life-changing. And since that time, I view any teaching job as just for me, it's like, wow, here I am. I'm going to save $60,000 here real quick. But I mean, I realize that makes me a freak in the teacher's lounge <laughs> because people are like, what are you talking about? And then I start to sound like a crazy man and start writing stuff on the whiteboard. And so I, I don't know. I got to figure out how to hone that message. I, I do get a lot of feedback on my website, you know, emails, people saying, wow, I really like your ideas. And I've my wife and I saved, you know, eighty thousand dollars, or I've gotten feedback from people who saved ninety thousand bucks. It makes me feel good because I know someone internalized the message. But to get that message out to a broader group of teachers, I guess that's ultimately what I'm working toward. But it, it's just so revolutionary, and it, some people are just resistive to the whole notion of being able to save anything. And well, and that's because nobody is promoting the savings message. There's no money in it. The money is in you handing your money to me or someone else. And so everyone's promoting those messages of a give us your money. Nobody's promoting a message of keep your money, get rich, enjoy your life the way you want. And that's the issue. Yeah, I heard one of your comments in a previous podcast about just the savings, the low savings rate. And I agree wholeheartedly because... You know, people say, well, save 10%, you're doing great, and 15%. And it's like, no, you're looking at a 40-year work horizon. Well, why do that? You don't have to. And, you know, when you start saving 50% of your household income, and it doesn't even feel like a hardship, then you're like, wow, it's really – it's like, what else do I believe in the world that is just wrong? And it's like the scales fall off, you know? My wife and I, you know, I'm so glad I'm talking to you on this podcast because – she and I, sometimes we were having coffee in the morning and I started talking and she's really into it. You know, she, her, she's awake. She sees, I guess the younger kids say woke, but sometimes I just bore her to tears because I'm just like, wow, it's, it's mind blowing to me that once you flip your thinking, what you can actually get accomplished. And I'm starting to come across more and more people who have had their paradigm has shifted, you know, and they're making great headway. But at the same time, sometimes when you're in this financial independence movement and talking with people, you realize there's almost like this little echo chamber and it's like maybe, what, 1% to 3% of the population is really into this. And I've got my doubts about how far it can be grown and I'm, I'm willing to bring as many people as we can. My fear is that it just might be a fringe movement of, of crazy five people, you know. And that's okay because we get to live life on our terms and yeah. everyone else – can pick up the book and read it and listen to a podcast and decide to make a choice or they can give yeah. their money away to someone else and that's the choice they make. Yeah. So you've spent a lot of time in education. What do you think of the current state of education? Wow, that's a big question. I look back at various at my education and my various phases and I was the kind of kid who was I was in the gifted class but I kind of did dumb things still in spite of being quote gifted i was i would say probably a b plus student in high school and then i was a miserable student at davidson because i was not very mature 
But I tell you all that because I did my best work when I had to do it and when my money was at stake. So I just see a lot of talk about financing and throwing more money at problems. And really, to me, learning is more about intrinsic motivation. And until people are ready for things, they're just not going to do it, whether that be financial education or coding. I guess one of the things you got to tell kids is show them, like I've heard a lot of interviews with the, I can't remember the founder's name at Treehouse Learning, about, you know, you get trained in this in 10 months, you have a $50,000 a year job. That might have fired me up at age 18, 19, you know, because that's a lot of money to a young person. But when you're telling people, oh, you want to do a good job so you can go off to college and spend four years there and then maybe go to med school. And then you tell the kid about student loans. I don't, I just don't like the model. And I'm I'm talking about the tertiary level, the college level. I think something's really gone awry there. It's like we're front loading fledgling adults with all this debt. You know, I'd hate to know I made $100,000 decisions at 18. And then I'm reading stories about this debt like doubling in spite of you making payments on it. And uh, we're talking about people with like just a general liberal arts degree. I just feel bad for a lot of those people. As far as like further on down, high school, middle school, I don't have a macro solution. I just try to light their fire in my classroom, you know, whether that be Spanish life skills. And I always try to tell them my story about, look, I was a screw up in many ways. You know, they see all my degrees. I try to put them somewhere on the wall and always tell them, you can always reinvent yourself in America. That's the beauty of America. You can go back to school and do things until you get it right. But (laughs) it's going to be a big caveat now because going back to school now with the tuition, what it is. I don't know if that message is really good advice now that I'm thinking about it. So I don't know. I guess I'm all over the board, but I am very big on maybe avoiding debt and doing some type of community college runaround or a degree hack. I wrote a post on how to hack a college degree on for like $7,500 in 10 months, just because, you know, I, I want the kids to see you don't have to go spend big money and spend four years of You know, 18 to 22, you're just putting on debt. You're not earning any money. Once you understand that in the financial independence movement, they're showing people work seven, 10 years, and they're living the life they want. Well, you know, I'd like to see kids use 18 to 22 to actually build for their future instead of just getting way in over their heads in debt. And that's something we have struggled with. I kind of expected a different outcome than the one we ended up with. And so we've changed things for my son to push him through faster to see what we can do with that. And I have talked to him about Treehouse. And actually, I think we need to go have that conversation again tonight to pull it up (laughs) and say, you know, it's hard to just say, it's hard to sometimes walk away from what everyone says is the way to do things. But the reality is, you know, if you can go through Treehouse and in 10 months come out with a $50,000 job, if you just put in a little bit more effort you can double and triple that income in no time. And if you can crank up the savings rates and save through your 20s to be able to retire in your early 30s, and we've had some people on the show recently who've done that, that's just phenomenal. And if you're later in life, you know, you still can get rid of the lifestyle creep, crank up your savings rates, and within a period of 10 to 12 years achieve financial freedom. Right. That was one of the things that I noticed is, as you know, talk, people talk about retire at 30, the likelihood you're never going to like do any work again is probably very low. But going in back and forth to work, when you already got this mentality of aggressive savings, it's amazing that you can have a, maybe even a bad job. I've had some teaching jobs where I this wasn't exactly my favorite, but when you're saving as a couple, ten, twelve, thirteen thousand dollars a month, you forget about a lot of that stuff. You know, you always know that if it gets really bad, you can just walk away from it. But most people are not in a financial position to do that. And I guess my wife and I have been there since, I guess, early forties, or we could think like that. And it's made some jobs more enjoyable. It's been kind of strange because you would think. 
oh, you can now leave the job. You're like, well, it doesn't feel so bad because I'm banking all the money. You know, does that make sense? But I'd like to see young people kind of start the, their careers like that. You know, it'd be awesome. They'd be making decisions from a position of financial strength as opposed to just desperation. And when you do that, you get treated with more respect at work because they know you can walk out and they no longer have the power you do. Correct. And more than likely, you're just a happier person because you don't have the general money stress that most people live under. And I think about, you know, the vibe in the teacher's lounge is, can be pretty bad because if you're going month to month and, you know, they're teens that I'm dealing with in high school and they have some bad days and they get to you sometimes. But, you know, you forget that when you're saving your money and you're sitting in a good position and you just kind of take it in stride maybe a little better. Uh, oh, God, I hope I'm not jinxing myself for this next year coming up. <laughs> but that was my last job. You know, there were some days that were pretty tough, but you just kind of roll with the punches and, and you understand why you're there working. You're always there for the kids. You know, you're doing your best with them. But there's also a financial component that's very strong because I'm not kidding. I think I figured out based on a nine-month work period because that's pretty much what we work. I think it averaged like 13000 a month, my wife and I, over those two years that we saved. I mean, that's good money to me. That is. It's very good money. And it's because you're living well below your means. You're living frugally. You're not spending it on things that are irrelevant. Yeah, I heard one of your comments before in another podcast talking about there's just very little that you seem to want these days. And yeah, I'm at that point also. I've kind of bought all the shiny objects that I thought would be great. And when I go back to the States here, I'm going to have to get a car. And I just want to have something very functional to get me to point A to point B. I won't have a big commute. I'm going to walk to my job. It's 100 meters from my house. There's really, I don't know, maybe I guess as you get older, it's kind of like when you try to buy like a, a present for your father. They never wanted anything because they already had all the stuff they wanted. I'm at that point in my life. And we don't watch a lot of TV, so we don't seem to want a lot. We just, things that are going to be useful to us. We want like, I know I'm going to be getting a grill, a smoker. I'm going to fill up the kitchen with all the stuff. We're going to probably buy bikes. And that, that's my short list right there. That's my purchases coming up for the year. That sounds like a perfect list. Yeah. It's, uh, it, uh, and I'll be really happy. You know, we have a public library. It's going to be about 50 yards from our house. Super walkable place we'll be living in, you know, so only drive we'll have to do is when we go into town to do our major shopping. So it's a simple, frugal lifestyle, but a lot of the things we like to do don't cost a lot of money. I jog every day. I work out. I've got a home gym. I'll have access to the school gym, public library, like I said. An internet connection will bring the whole world to me. doesn't cost a lot to live like that. It's actually the way I live here in Mexico. It's the way I like to live now. And you've made some big strides with your diet and exercise, haven't you? Yes. Uh, back in 2011, I, I was coaching basketball, and I think my son was, what would he have been there, about five years old. And I'm yelling at the ref one night trying to get a technical because I'm not agreeing with the fish, and the, and the ref wouldn't give me a tech, and that made me really irate. And I saw myself after the game. I was flush red, and I, was, I thought to myself, you have to drop some pounds. And I was probably 275, and I'm 6'7", so... You know, people are like, you know, you're not that heavy. Well, when you're six, seven, you can hide a lot of weight. But I basically started Tim Ferriss's slow carb diet. I lost the 20 pounds in the 30 days, as he says in the blog post. And from that day on, I've been a guinea pig. I'm 240 now. I sometimes go as like 235. But yeah, I basically do some variant of a low carb diet. I tell people I'm a no low slow carber. And since I've learned how to keep my weight more of an optimal range. I, I allow for cheats here and there, and I won't lie. I've had more beer here in Mexico than I normally would, but I'm aware of what impacts my weight gain when I go through that. And about two years ago, I started a jogging streak. The day we leave here, which will be Saturday, the 9th of September, or excuse me, of June, I will hit 700 straight days, and I have not missed a day of jogging. I've been lifting weights, and I recently started a push-up streak where I just do 25 push-ups in the morning before I go jogging. I'm like uh, day, I think, 25 of that. And so I'm starting to realize what's good for me is I like very minimal goals, things that I don't look at them and like, oh, God, I don't want to do this. Like my jog is, I've got to jog at least 12 minutes. 
Well, I almost always go beyond 12 minutes, but I know if I'm not feeling it, I'm stopping at 12. And, you know, 25 push-ups, I can crank those out, you know, no problem. I have also have little goals with like my Duolingo, studying French on that and other things. But I've realized that at this point in my life, I don't like big monstrous goals. They kind of scare me and they make me kind of freak out. So I'm really kind of honing the minimal goal. And as far as diet, I've also incorporated, I've done fast and intermittent fasting. And and for me, it's very easy to fast. I've done up to five days. I like the way my body feels after. I like the mental clarity. It's really kind of cool to me to see what your body can do. I've even gone as far as I did a dry fast where you have no water. You don't even, I didn't even brush my teeth for two days. Keep that a secret, everybody. And then, no showering, but apparently it kind of accelerates the fasting process. It's very popular among Russians. It was no biggie. I thought it was going to be like really hard, and but it's really cool to see what your body can do. And so, yeah, I'm a freaky guy in that realm. That's interesting because I guess we're programmed to say you must eat. You must eat three meals a day or more. You have to do this. You have to do that. And the reality is a lot of these things aren't exactly true. I mean, if you go back through history... When there were no grocery stores, you couldn't just eat when you wanted. You had to go out and hunt and kill animals and deal with all of that type of stuff. Or deal with seasonal food, because it only grows in the summer. It doesn't grow all year round outside. There's a reason we store fat, right? We're set up to be burning, what, glycogen or ketones. And most people, because of the modern diet, they're always carb loaded and they're in insulin storage mode and they gain weight. That's the thing that the whole fat shaming, you're fat because you're lazy. No, when you have insulin resistance and you're in fat storage mode, and I'm by no means a medical doctor, you're going to gain weight. And, you know, I remember I used to work out and run, but I was eating too many carbs. And I'm sure I was getting toward, you know, metabolic syndrome, had the kind of the beer gut starting and I didn't even drink beer, not very much. And when I learned how to kind of flip that switch and go to ketone burn mode. That was a real revelation to me. I lost all the weight so quickly and I've kept it off and I really feel good. I really feel healthy. You know, a lot of the inflammation went away in my body. I don't feel achy like I used to. Like I said, the mental clarity, the more constant energy throughout the day. And it's really made me the kind of person that's like, yeah, what else gets pushed to us that's just not true, that's got a, you know, an agenda behind it? Oh, you got to eat three meals a day to get your blood sugar up. Oh, yeah, give me some carbs. No, it's made me kind of a little more skeptical. As I look through all different areas of life, the more I'm looking, the more I'm coming to the conclusion that most of what we've been told has some sort of basis in somebody making money somewhere at some point. And we don't need to to do all of this. I think back to the 10% savings rate. That was in, in, If you do 15, you're just really knocking it out of the park. That puts you on that long career path. You think you're doing great. Well, you know, assets under management, they get feed to death. You're going to work and you you get taxed on wages and the employer's happy you're there working. (laughs) I'm like the last person in this equation. Hey, I am making progress, but I'm crawling or walking slowly when I could be jogging or running. That's what I learned on my FI journey is that, man, you know, you're not going to get rich overnight, but you can get what's going to feel rich. You're going to feel rich in like three to five to seven years. Uh, Like I always say, I'm just, you know, air quotes, just a teacher. I have a regular job. None of the stuff I talk about is from inheritance or I didn't have like rentals on the side or a prosperous side hustle. It was just saving money. And that's because I loaded up all the accounts. You know, I didn't do the 10% or 15%. I had coworkers say, what are you doing with that again? Why are you doing that? I kind of starting to doubt myself. You know, why am I doing this? Because no one else was doing it. This is like pre-Mr. Money Mustache and all of that going on. If you've got an inclination to save like a crazy person, I would say, yeah, go do it. You'll figure it out later. That you will. Success in one area of life tends to carry over to success in other parts of life. It just keeps going. And over time, it's not an overnight success, but over time, you can do amazing things. 
And I think you just have to start with the first step and then just keep going and keep course correcting and keep showing up. You have that ability to do that. Yeah, I forget about that sometimes. You know, like success in one thing leads to the next success. And I think back to my own path, like the when I started learning Spanish, I could barely pass Spanish in, in college. And truth be told, I think the last course, they just wanted me out. So it's kind of a humiliating experience to be the flow killer in the class. But when I started getting some aptitude, that really gave me a real boost. And I actually went back to the uh, homecoming party and went to the Spanish, my Spanish instructor's homecoming party and, and spoke with her in Spanish. And her mouth literally fell open. I remember thinking, God, that felt great. And, and so and it gave me a win outside of athletics because athletics was something that came naturally to me. And I never envisioned myself as like, oh, speaking Spanish. And, and it just kind of led to next, you know, gave me confidence to go pursue an MBA in spite of my things kept going. But if I had a little bit better guidance earlier in my life, and, you know, I know hindsight's twenty twenty, a lot of those missteps could have been uh, avoided. And that's what I'm trying to do with my son. But, you know, you got to keep moving forward, right? And uh, you'll get there, maybe a little later than you'd like, but you'll get there. That you will. You just keep taking those steps and you keep enjoying the journey because that's exactly what it is. Is there anything that we should have talked about today that we haven't gotten to yet? There's a lot of talk about gratitude. I think, to me, my personality, my temperament, when I would hear that, it would just kind of put me off. But I, I realize in one sense, I always did have some of that. And so, it, I don't know, if you're the kind of person you think certain notions are a little corny or hokey, just kind of re reframe the, the, the issue in your head. But I realized one of the things that helped me was when I went on uh, my time to Central America and I saw poverty when I was in Honduras and see people living in like a mud hut with a straw roof and traveling through rural Mexico and El Salvador. And I, I was, like I mentioned earlier, I was in Brazil and, and it was tough in Brazil back then. You know, there's a lot of poverty. You see people sleeping on the streets. And I've been to India from Saudi Arabia. Having seen all that, that also made me realize, oh my gosh, you know, you live in the United States, a first world country, and you have the way, there are ways to reinvent yourself and go do things. I know it's easy to kind of like cry in your beer, and we've all, I mean, I've been points in my life where I just thought, golly, it's just not not happening. Well, I remember being like mid-20s and just, you know, substitute teaching for trying to figure out my next step. Just remember what you have by by virtue of being in a first world country where you have access to training. You know, you don't have to go spend a lot of money. You'll figure something out, but take that next step. And reinvent yourself if you have to. That might just be going to the public library and reading. A lot of public libraries, they have free online training. But get yourself to the next level to where you're marketable and you can get a job that's going to pay you a little bit of money and start saving it. People need to understand what they have. And that's something I think a lot of immigrants, people from immigrant backgrounds, they have an, almost an advantage on someone that's been born in the States. They don't see what's around them that can be tapped into. They just take it for granted. And I agree with you. If you make $33,000 a year, roughly, that puts you in the top, maybe it's around 30000 the top 1% of the world. Wow. It does not take much to be in that top 1%. The problem is we're all living in a bubble where $30,000 seems poor, right? Right. <laughs> and, and that's the problem. But if you reframe your bubble and you start looking around and you change the lens and how you look at things, it is not hard to cut your spending and to still live a wonderful life and to have a lot of cool stuff and do it on the fraction of what you think you have to spend. And that's the other thing. When you have the time and the space to think through this stuff, it makes it a lot easier. But when you're on that hamster wheel, Oh, yeah. You're kind of screwed because you just don't have the time and the space to think through it and to make the plans and to, to realize that that's where you are. 
And yeah, gratitude, I think, is a very big part of it. Just being thankful for what you do have and appreciating it. I think too often we have expectations and that that is an issue. Yeah, and the expectations in a consumer society are really high. Just the images you see on TV, like what's portrayed as a normal life, and I'm always like drawing up a budget for that that set, you know, like what would this really cost? You know, it's insane. But um, I know just my, that experience helped me so much. And, and I know anytime I have a job, I'm always talking to my, my immigrant kids, trying to pick their brains, you know, and how they see the world and, and opportunities. Pretty much I'm, I'm talking about where I live, Indians and Mexicans. At first, they're kind of like, Wow, you're really interested in this. So yeah, it's because you guys are probably doing some really great stuff, you know. And you, a lot of people aren't doing what you're doing, you know. I view them as a resource to be used, in a sense. What are some of the things that you've learned from them? Well, I noticed a couple of the Patels from them that, that they seem to be very good at like, uh, like a family personal finance, like as a group, you helping each other out and getting people set up. I was thinking about that. That would be something that's really not that hard to do for a family, but that's just not the way a lot of extended families view personal finance. I was thinking, I have nephews and nieces. This is something that's going through my head now. It's like, I want to just have a shared document with them and explain some ideas with them, like say say on Google Drive. Are you all funding your IRA this year? Because if you're not, you're missing a golden opportunity. Do any of you need like $1,000 to to fund it, a family loan? That's a little thing, but that could provide a tremendous benefit down the road. And then that would not only would that be good financially, but it's um, it's an example that they would learn to carry on with their nephews and nieces or their sons and daughters and but there's no vision of, of like extended family finance. I think the difference, what you see is in America, everyone is told to stand on their own. Yeah. And you have to be that rugged individual person. Whereas in most of these other cultures, they live generationally. I'm sure it happens in Mexico. I know it happens in India where it's multi-generations living together and families living together or they're living extremely close to each other and there are shared resources because they all help each other. And here we tend to be more individualistic. That kind of generational mentality coupled with educational preparation. Oh man, is that a, (laughs) that's unbelievable combo. I plan on using some of those ideas in our family as best I can, but you know, I'm finding that People don't like, even family members, they don't like talking about money. You know, it's, it's just so personal. That's one of the things I find frustrating is I see how I could help people more, but people aren't very receptive to the message. And then you kinda like, you're kind of like, well, do I keep, do I try to come from a different angle? It's a, it's a cultural thing, right? People don't talk about money. I was also going to say, I, I, from my, a lot of my Mexican students, I see a real entrepreneurism I see guys come open restaurants, businesses, they have houses paid for. It's pretty incredible what you see people do come with a lot of times, not a lot, nothing. Might even start working as day laborers and you know, those wages aren't very high. What they end up becoming is it's uh, inspirational. That's the word. They have a plan. They're willing to show up and do the work. They don't spend a lot. They keep what they what they earn, and they invest it. They keep going, and it's not it is not hard to do. It's extremely doable. It's foolproof. It's almost formulaic. It will work. It will. It just takes time, and I think that's the bigger problem. Everybody wants it yesterday. Yeah, and that's just not going to happen. You have to put the time in and that's just the reality of it you have to do the work if you're not willing to then you're not going to get well let me ask you this how do you deal with the frustration of not 
helping people. Like when you try, sometimes my message just doesn't get through. That drives me crazy. It's like, I guess it's like frustrations with teaching. when People just aren't getting it and don't want to get it. You know what? I can't control anyone else. I can only do my best. I can put the information out. All of this stuff is being put out for free. So mm-hmm. you've, you've got all the information, whether you listen to me, to you, or to... There, there's a whole ton of people out there yeah. putting out information for essentially free. It's up to people. It's their choice. You can't make anyone do anything. They have to step up and do it themselves. The opportunity is there. The, and I, I say this again and again. The biggest obstacle people face is the reflection in the mirror. <laughs> that's it i mean that is the obstacle right there you can overcome the person in the mirror you can have an amazing life or you can decide to let other people have an amazing life by giving them all your money it's really that simple i did a, an interview with another blog and uh i wrote something to that to, to that effect i said your financial solution watches you brush your teeth every morning it's so true. It's it's like, you know, you are the captain of your ship. A lot of people, I don't know, they, they, they I guess they're uh, waiting for a financial Santa Claus. And I realize certain people have certain challenges. But the headway you can make is astounding. Once you start making a one win, two wins, it starts growing, snowballing. And then one of the things I recommend is uh, track your wealth. Oh, and you start watching it go up. That lit a fire under me. And that comes down, we've talked about having your balance sheet. So, you know, it's the scorecard of where are you today? Looking at your cash flow to see how is your money flowing and where is it going? And where do you want it to go? And where do you want it to take you? Yeah. So that brings up the question, you know, what's one action step people can do to move forward on this? You know, when you mentioned to that to me earlier, I wasn't sure what I was going to say, but I'm going to tell you what got my wife and I really going. I had a little spreadsheet I made that I would print out every month and I would put it on the refrigerator. It had a breakdown of all our retirement account savings and bank balances, the mortgage the equity and the the remaining balance in a list of, I'd have to go dig it up as I haven't really used it as religiously now that I've kind of hit my number, but also the ongoing expenses, projected expense, things like that. My wife has an MBA. We did the program together, but she's really not into money like we are. She she likes to save money and just live her life. And But I'd say, honey, I, the update's there and she'd go and stare at it and she would just say, are those numbers right? Because it, it, as it started to grow, like 400, 600,000, 750, I mean, it was shocking. And that's when we realized, holy moly, we are doing the right thing here by just doubling down, tripling down on the savings. But even when we weren't at those big numbers, you know, when you, when you see that you have a net worth of 50,000 or 100,000, and it keeps you aware of where you need to save, what bills you're paying down to build, and you know, you're building equity in your mortgage. It's something that'll go on for five to 10 years and it'll be like your little, your reference point. And it just has to be right there in the fridge. If you're worried about like the, the, the Orkin man coming in and looking at it, he's probably not going to look at it because it's going to be behind pictures and everything else. But that really was a good reference point for both of us. Where you focus your attention is where you get results. And if you're constantly looking at your numbers, you're going to get results there because you're putting attention and effort towards making them grow. And that's a perfect action step. Yeah. I also remember that motivated me to do things like, you know, front load all the accounts and zero out paychecks if we had enough money to live on. So you can imagine some of those months, the growth was just shocking, you know, watch five, 10,000 bucks a month, you know, month after month. So it'll happen. The thing you need to know about that when you start tracking your wealth and and making it grow, it'll take off at some point and it'll blow your mind. Just, it'll, it'll surprise you 
And he'll say, why didn't I do this before? Well, you were a financial idiot before, like all of us. <laughs> Very much true. If people would like to learn from your wisdom and find you and read more about what you do, where should they connect? My website is millionaireeducator.com. And I have uh, quite a few old posts there. I, I'm kind of on uh, taking a, a blogging break for right now. I'll start back this summer. I also have a, uh, I'm at Twitter and I put a few uh, links there now and again. It's uh, Ed underscore Mills underscore. That's my uh, Twitter feed. And I have also a millionaire, educa millionaire Educator Facebook page where I also link my posts occasionally. So I'm not hard to find. Millionaire Educator, Ed Mills, you'll see that, and uh, just hook up with me. I answer email questions as best I can, primarily from teachers trying to figure out what to do with their retirement accounts. It can be somewhat difficult for them because we have a lot of uh, high-fee options. If you have something, a question about that, send it to me, and I'll give you my, my two cents at no charge. That's awesome. Thank you so much for being so kind and for sharing and to giving back to the community. Well, I'd like to see people get wealthy because I know it makes them better teachers and it makes them happier and gives them more options. That it does. Thank you for joining us today. It's been a pleasure to have you on Richard Soul. Thanks, Rocky. I'm glad we finally hooked up. I've been wanting to do this interview for a long time. I appreciate it. <laughs>